Greetings, fellow learners. Now, before we get into this wonderful world of informer encoders, I have a thought-provoking question for you. For your personal projects, what data would you like to forecast? Would it be something like weather-based data or warehouse operations-based data? Or is it something else? Please comment down below and I would love to hear your thoughts. Now, this video is going to be divided into three main passes. In the pass one, we will discuss the informer and the informer encoder at a very high level. Pass two, we're gonna dive into some more encoder details. And then pass three, we'll actually take a look at some more open source informer code just to get to see how the pieces go together. Now it's gonna be fun, so let's get to it. For this first pass, let's illustrate the high level working of the informer. And then we can dive deeper into the encoder. This is the informer architecture. To the input, we pass in some time series vectors and each vector corresponds to available data points at that given time step. Now, this information is passed into the encoder and through this encoder, they undergo some attention and distillation processes. And then we get some output encoder vectors. Now in the output, you'll notice there will be less number of vectors than there were in the input. And these output vectors are also some form of transformed version of the inputs. These are then passed into the decoder. And we also pass some subset of the input to as context to the decoder. And the decoder then generates the next chunk of predicted timestamps. And that's a high level overview of how data flows through this architecture. Now we're gonna drill down into the encoder, adding some more details with every pass. So the encoder has four main pieces, the embedding transformation, the prob sparse full attention, the post attention transformations, and then the distillation operation. So let's take a look at each part, starting with the embedding transformation. So the input to this, and hence the informer, is raw time series vectors. Each vector corresponds to a timestamp, and each entry in the vector corresponds to some information that we have at that timestamp. The output is the same number of vectors where each vector is now continuous, and each timestamp vector has more information now packed into it. Now it's part two. We pass these continuous time series vectors into the prob sparse full attention unit. And the output of this are the same number of time step vectors, but each vector would have been transformed such that the more important vectors are highlighted. These important vectors are active vectors and the non-important vectors are the lazy vectors. Now part three. This part will perform some transformations to the incoming vectors, including layer normalization, dropout, adding residual connections, activations, and convolutions. Now, each of these transformations will aid in training this deep, complex neural network effectively. And then we have the part four, which is the distillation operation. We've highlighted the active vectors and the lazy vectors as input. And once the distillation is complete, we only fetch the active vectors along with some transformations. Distillation in chemistry involves isolating a compound from a mixture. And distillation here is isolating active vectors from the rest of the vectors. And so with these four pieces together, I hope you can see how the encoder converts raw discrete time series vectors into a subset of continuous time series vectors that have more rich information. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Why use prob sparse attention instead of full self attention? A, high dimensional sequences are more efficiently processed. B, long sequences are more efficiently processed. C, low dimensional sequences are more efficiently processed. Or D, short sequences are more efficiently processed. 
I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. And the correct answer is B. Long sequences are more efficiently processed. But can you tell me why? Comment down your reasoning in the comments section below and let's have a discussion. And at this point, if you think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. And that's gonna do it for quiz one and pass one of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I'm gonna be back to quiz you. For pass two, we are going to walk through the encoder architecture diagram that I put together. And so we mentioned before in pass one that there are four parts to the encoder. The first is the embedding operations that are performed. The second is prob sparse attention, which is this unit way over here. That's pretty long. The third is the transformations that we see over here, large sequence of transformations. And then the fourth, which would be this trapezium here, is going to be the distillation operation. So let's go back to the beginning and try to look at some more extra details about how these operations are performed. So to the input, we have some raw time series data. And in this case, I took the dimensions to be a batch size of 30 with 100 time steps, and each of those time step vectors has 12 items in it. So each vector is of size 12. Now, each of these 12 items would actually be some real world concept or construct that we would have filled into these vectors. During the embedding phase over here, we first perform a convolution 1D, which is just going to do a transformation in order to get some continuous vector projections over here. We then also add some positional encoding information. Now, this is required because each of these individual time steps, they actually have ordered meaning, but it's not really encoded into the vectors themselves. And adding the positional encodings is going to add this positional information, like the first vector is first, the second vector is second, and so on. And then the third kind of embedding information that we want to add is global time steps, which is basically adding information like holidays, special events, or hour of day, day of week, month of year, and so on. And so when we add these embeddings together, we get the same set or the same number of 100 input vectors, but each of those time step vectors now has some more information that's encoded within them. For more information about this entire embedding operation, you can check out my full video right over here. So now from the discrete time series vectors, after the embedding operation, we would get a set of continuous time series vectors each time series vector now being of some 512 dimensions. Now for the part two of our encoder, it's going to be prob sparse full attention. Now, if you look at this architecture diagram, you can see that the multi-head prob sparse attention spans from all the way over here till the end of these overlapping rectangles. So the reason for the overlapping rectangles is because this is going to be multi-headed in the sense that each of the operations discussed here is going to be happening eight times in parallel. And this is in line with the original transformer neural network architecture, where with eight different parallel heads, the network is able to now learn more complex and intricate patterns in the data itself. And this is great for very complex time series data. Start us off, each time series vector in the embedding vectors is now split into three parts, or it is projected into three different vectors, a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. Now query, key, and value are just different representations of the same time series vector data. 
Now, why are we using the prop sparse attention instead of the normal full self-attention? It's mostly because in the original full self-attention architecture, we would have multiplied all of these query vectors with these key vectors in order to determine the attention vectors. The attention vectors would help us determine which of these time series vectors is going to be important versus not. However, if we perform that operation, it's going to be an order of n squared operation, where n is the length of the input. And for long time series data, that's going to be an extremely inefficient operation. So to combat that, we use prob sparse attention, which is far more efficient in terms of time and space complexity, being O of n log n. And in order to avoid query and key being multiplied together, it's going to kind of do some very clever tricks where in every case that you'll notice here, the query and key are never fully ever multiplied to each other. In this case, for example, the query is only multiplied with the sample of the key. Further down, you'll see the key is only multiplied with the sample of the query. And all of this is done to ensure that the attention matrix over here is computed in O of n log n time instead of quadratic time. So once we have the attention vectors and we've applied the attention vectors to the original time series data, we will then end up with a set of the same dimension of vectors of 30 cross 100 cross 512, where the active vectors are going to be highlighted with higher because they have the higher attention values. And these would be different from the passive vectors, which are going to have lower attention values. Now for the part three of the process, once the prob sparse attention is complete, we perform a series of transformations. And these transformations are typically of like fivefold. They include dropout, they include adding residual connections, they include a convolution operation, an activation operation, and even a layer normalization. So overall, all of these operations together will enhance the speed, efficiency, and performance and stability of training altogether. But we can walk through these one by one to see what they do. Dropout is the process of randomly turning off neurons in a network so that it is able to better generalize. And when a neural network is able to better generalize, it performs much better on unseen data. This connection over here is a residual connection or a skip connection. And skip connections allow gradients to propagate in the network. And this is required, especially during the training phase. Neural networks are trained with back propagation. So you'll have basically gradients that will have to propagate from one end of the network to the beginning of the network. But for very deep networks, these gradients become so small that the network doesn't learn. And so for very large networks, like is the case in this informer architecture, these residual connections can really help in stimulating more gradients and so that they will almost certainly flow all the way towards the beginning of the network. So if we have a gradient that flows just in this direction, it might like vanish on its own somewhere around here but because of the skip connection over here, you can see that it can directly, the gradients can propagate all the way towards the beginning. And so you'll at least have some learning that goes on towards the beginning of the network. And so residual connections are quite liberally used. Next, we have a convolution operation. So this convolution operation specifically here is only of kernel size one. So when we add kernels, kernels are going to be parameters that are learnable by the model. It's only going to be of size one and it slides across each and every single timestamp. What this means that effectively, this just performs a linear transformation of the data and is independent of the time step. And if you perform a linear transformation of the data, it's the equivalent of adding like a feed forward neural network to your typical data. And this can enhance the patterns and complexities that can be picked up by the model. The next step is activations. Activations will add nonlinear transformations to the data and also help the model understand very complex patterns in the data itself. Next, we have layer normalization. 
Layer normalization is going to be responsible for stabilizing values in our tensors so that training is also stable. And so overall, the five operations that we discussed really do help in assisting and training to make sure that they're faster, more efficient, and more stable, especially for a very long and deep ne and complex network like the Informer. Now, next up is distillation. So with the out put of the phase one, two, and three, we are now going to have time series vectors where some of these vectors are going to be active vectors. They're gonna have higher activation values. Whereas the other vectors are gonna be more lazy vectors. And we want to extract the more active vectors or active queries from the rest. And that's what distillation will do. And with distillation, we're going to start with a convolution operation. This is going to help each time series vector get some local information embedded within its own context. Then we have activation. And like we said before, this is going to allow the network to pick up on more complex patterns. Batch normalization is going to stabilize training. And then we have max pooling with a stride of two. And this is going to effectively slice the time dimension in half. And that's why if we start with some dimensions of time over here, that's going to be much more curtailed in the output end. And so as a result, distillation will only extract the transformed versions of the active vectors so that the most concentrated and rich information is going to be passed to the next stage. And this next stage could either be another stacked encoder or it could just directly be the decoder itself. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Why perform transformations after the attention operation? A, to ensure training is stable. B, to ensure the training doesn't suffer from vanishing gradients. C, to better learn complex patterns in data. Or D, to encode raw time step vectors. Note that multiple options here may be correct. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to answer this question. And the answers are A, B, and C. But why are A, B, and C correct? Let me know your reasoning down in the comments section below. And let's have a discussion. And that's going to do it for quiz time and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. For this final pass, I wanted to actually go through some of the Informer open source code and specifically look at the components of the encoder here. We're gonna code this out more specifically in future videos, but I think that just having a holistic understanding of what's going on can really help. So this here is the informer class. And in this informer constructor over here, you can see that the four main subcategories in the encoding phase are going on. So first we have the embedding part, which is over here. This is then followed by the initialization of the encoder architecture. And now with the encoder, we're passing in a few parameters. The first parameter is going to be the list of each of the prob sparse encoder layers, along with the list of the distillation layers. Now you can see that the encoder layer specifically takes care of prob sparse attention, as well as the transformations that go on after that. So, and specifically prob sparse attention will be done by attention layer, which is defined here. So let's now take a deeper look into each of these parts. So in order to start phase one, we first need to take the raw time series data, and then we need to embed that data, and we do so with this data embedding class. So let's go to embed.py and scroll all the way down, and you're gonna see this embedding class over here. So this embedding class has a constructor as well as a forward pass. You can see from the forward pass that it's going to add a projection of like what the true original time series data is. It's gonna add some positional embedding 
And it's also going to add some temporal embedding. Temporal embedding is going to be the hour of day, day of week, month of year, holiday, special events. All of that will be added together. So this final vector over here, X, is going to have all of that context and is returned. And once it's returned, you go back to the model over here, go back to the informer, I think it's up here, right. So once that's returned for the encoder embedding, we're going to now initialize our encoder itself. So let's go look at the encoder class. In encoder.py, let's scroll down to the encoder class here. Now from this class, you'll again see there's a constructor and then there's also a forward pass. So in our constructor, you can see we have attention layers. This is going to be the instantiation of encoder layers. And then we have conv layers, which is going to be the distillation layers. Now what this is going to do during the actual forward pass is that we have like a bunch of attention layers and the same number of distillation layers. It's basically going to perform encoder part with prop sparse attention followed by distillation. And then another time encoder with prob sparse attention plus some transformations and then distillation again. And it'll keep repeating depending on the number of attention layers and distillation layers that exist. So when we say attention layers, again, like we mentioned before, this attention layer is actually going to be an encoder layer here, which is defined right up here. So this here is the encoder layer. Once again, we have the constructor and we have a forward pass. And you can see here that in the forward pass, the encoder layer performs, it performs both the prop sparse attention, which is right here. And then it performs a series of transformations that help in stabilizing and speeding up and enhancing the neural network training itself. And you could see that the convolution operation, like we discussed before, is a kernel of size one. And so it's not really learning local information. It's more of just a linear transformation in this case. Now let's go back here. So with this attention layer, we would have had the prob sparse attention plus transformations performed. And then now we have conv layer. Conv layer is going to be this conv layer over here. And this is just going to perform distillation that we described previously, where we have, you could see convolution, normalization, batch normalization, activation, and max pooling. And the goal here is now we have active queries and the rest of the queries, and we kind of just want to extract the more active time steps that give us the richest information. And we'll take this, which is now X is going to be sliced in half on the time dimension and will be passed into the next encoder layer, or it will be passed into the decoder. And so, yeah, that's kind of this entire file as we see it here. And we also took a look at the model file, specifically at least the encoder part right here. And this part is now going to be flushed into the decoder soon. But you can see that in the forward pass of the encoder, we're going to first perform the embedding. We then perform the encoder, which is going to be a combination of prob sparse attention, transformations, and distillation. And then we'll now pass it into the decoder itself, which we will talk about in another video. Quiz time. Ooh, this is going to be a fun one. What is the point of distillation? A, to reduce the dimensionality of each vector. B, to reduce the number of time series vectors. C, to reduce the time complexity of the network's forward pass. Or D, to reduce the space complexity of the network's forward pass. Note here too that multiple options may be correct. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answers are B, C, and D. Now, why are B, C, and D correct? Well, you can tell me your reasoning down in the comment section below, and let's have a discussion. 
And at this point, if you do think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. And that's gonna do it for quiz time and pass three of this explanation, but before we go, let's generate a summary. So we talked about the Informer Architecture's encoder, and encoding can happen in four parts. Embeddings operation, the prop sparse full attention, post attention transformations, and distillation operation. So the embedding operation allows position information and timestamp information to be captured in the vectors to generate more informative embeddings. Prob sparse full attention is an efficient way to highlight the time series vectors that are more important than others. We highlight the active vectors. The post attention transformations allow the training phase to be stable and performant for deep networks. And then distillation is performed, which will isolate the active vectors from the other vectors. And this can help in making the forward pass more efficient and faster, especially as we stack encoder layers. And that's all that we have for today. If you're curious about the original Transformer architecture and want to see a bigger deep dive there too, check out this playlist of Transformers from scratch. You won't regret it. Thank you all so much for watching. And once again, if you think I deserve it, please do give this video a like and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.